Our text this morning is Mark chapter 7. These are the words of God. Then came together unto him the Pharisees and certain of the scribes, which came from Jerusalem. And when they saw some of his disciples eat bread with defiled, that is to say, with unwashed hands, they found fault. For the Pharisees and all the Jews, except they wash their hands oft, eat not, holding the tradition of the elders. And when they come from the market, except they wash, they eat not. And many other things there be which they have received to hold as the washing of cups and pots, brazen vessels, and of tables. Then the Pharisees and scribes asked him, Why walk not thy disciples according to the tradition of the elders, but eat bread with unwashed hands? He answered and said unto them, Well hath Esaias prophesied of you hypocrites, as it is written, This people honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. Howbeit, in vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. For laying aside the commandment of God, ye hold the tradition of men as the washing of pots and cups and many other such like things ye do. And he said unto them, Full well ye reject the commandment of God, that ye may keep your own tradition. For Moses said, Honor thy father and thy mother, and whoso curseth father or mother, let him die the death. But ye say, If a man shall say to his father or mother, it is Corban, that is to say, a gift, by whatsoever thou mightest be profited by me, he shall be free. And ye suffer him no more to do aught for his father or his mother, making the word of God of none effect through your tradition, which ye have delivered. And many such like things do ye. And when he had called all the people unto him, he said unto them, Hearken unto me, every one of you, and understand, there is nothing from without a man that entering into him can defile him. But the things which come out of him, those are they that defile the man. If any man have ears to hear, let him hear. And when he was entered into the house from the people, his disciples asked him concerning the parable. And he saith unto them, Are ye so without understanding also? Do you not perceive that whatsoever thing from without entereth into the man, it cannot defile him? Because it entereth not into his heart, but into the belly, and goeth out into the draught, purging all meats. And he said, That which cometh out of the man, that defileth the man. For from within, out of the heart of men, proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lasciviousness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within and defile the man. And from thence he arose and went into the borders of Tyre and Sidon and entered into an house and would, and would have no man know it, but he could not be hid. For a certain woman whose young daughter had an unclean spirit heard of him and came and fell at his feet. The woman was a Greek, a Syrophoenician by nation, and she besought him that he would cast forth the devil out of her daughter. But Jesus said unto her, let the children first be filled, for it is not meet to take the children's bread and to cast it unto the dogs. And she answered and said unto him, Yes, Lord, yet the dogs under the table eat of the children's crumbs. And he said unto her, For this saying, Go thy way, the devil is gone out of thy daughter. And when she was come to her house, she found the devil gone out, and her daughter laid upon the bed. And again, departing from the coast of Tyre and Sidon, he came unto the sea of Galilee, through the midst of the coast of Decapolis. And they bring unto him one that was deaf and had an impediment in his speech, and they beseech him to put his hand upon him. And he took him aside from the multitude and put his fingers into his ears, and he spit and touched his tongue. And looking up to heaven, he sighed and saith unto him, Ephetah, that is, be opened. And straightway his ears were opened, and the string of his tongue was loosed, and he spake plain. And he charged them that they should tell no man. But the more he charged them, so much the more, a great deal, they published it. And they, and were, and were beyond measure, astonished, saying, He hath done all things well. He maketh both the deaf to hear and the dumb to speak. Let's pray. Our God and Father, by your spirit, we pray that you would take your word and open our eyes, open our hearts, open our ears, so we might hear and see and believe glorious things out of your word. We pray that you would do the great miracle of preaching, that by the proclamation of your word, you would open our hearts that we, and, and fill us with your spirit, that we might walk in all your ways. We pray this in the mighty name of Jesus, and amen. amen. Have your words or actions ever come back to haunt you? 
I'm sure it has. I'm sure there's plenty of examples you could point to in your past of things you said that you wish you could take back or things you claimed you would never do that you now, in fact, do. But perhaps you once said in your youth, like many young college students would say, you know, they look at their parents, they look at families around them, and they think, when I'm a parent, I will never do thus and such. I will never do X, Y, Z. And then what, what do you find? You become a parent, and you find yourself doing thus and such. You find yourself doing the X, Y, Z that you said you would never do. Uh, you, you find that you, you look back at the things you claimed you'd never do, the, the, the food you would never eat. I'll, I'll never get a taste for, for that food. You know, the, the, the person who always hates coffee and then you know, before you know it, they get a little bit older and they go, oh, this isn't so bad. And their, their, their palate acquires the taste. And you who are the most, the, the most staunch anti-coffee uh, advocate suddenly are, are sipping the mochas. There's, there's really only two ways to respond when, when that, um, I hate to call it hypocrisy, but when that, when that comes to light, the, the things you claimed you would never do, or the food you'd claim you'd never eat, or the, the thing you, you, you made it such a hard, hard stance on uh, at one point, um, and, it, and it comes out that you, you've actually become inconsistent with what you claimed um, you would never do or eat or say. There's only really two responses uh, to that moment of revelation. It's you know, to either laugh at yourself and your past follies, your silliness of your past, laughing at yourself, or it's to, to, to double down and, and burn with vindictive anger and get upset at the fact that it was pointed out. And, and we do that even with inconsequential things. Like I said, it, perhaps it was uh, growing up, you were the kid that hated some, something and, and you grow up and you're, and you're you start liking that food, and then all your family and friends are like, Did he, weren't you the guy that hated that thing? And you say, there's two ways to respond. It's to laugh and say, yeah, I sure was. I was the person that hated mushrooms. Or I was the person that hated ca- uh, coffee. I was the person that, uh, but now there's only one, one of two ways to respond. It's to laugh at yourself or to double down and, and say, how dare you, and, and lash out. Jesus, in this text, has at least two sharp barbs for us to hear. Uh, One is aimed at the Pharisees and the second is aimed at the Syrophoenician woman. Both are sharp examples of Christ's divine wit. Uh, and, and, And as we work through, I hope you'll see that Christ wielding his wit, this divine humor, is intended to shock in such a way to bring to light our hypocrisy, to bring to light our need to seek after him, to bring to light our need to laugh at ourselves, to not take ourselves so seriously that we might lay hold of him. So what I want to do is do a 30,000 foot view level of the text, and then we'll make a couple, we'll actually work back through the text sort of in backwards fashion. So we'll work through it, and then we'll work backwards through it, and you'll see why in a moment. Uh, this, this chapter opens, uh, remember the feeding of the 5,000 has just taken place, um, and, and we, we transition into a new phase of Christ's ministry, but it, it bears some of the similar marks that we've seen in other um, episodes in Jesus' ministry. Uh, a Jerusalem embassy of Pharisees, who are likely um, assigned agents to keep an eye, to keep tabs on uh, this rabbi that is going around gathering crowds of people, 5, 000, at least 5,000 men strong, um, sending out his disciples, 70 disciples into all of Israel, uh, casting out demons, bringing judgment, uh, declaring judgment upon the towns that wouldn't believe, healing, casting out demons. Word is getting around, and the Jerusalem embassy comes again. Um, they're likely tasked with keeping tabs on Jesus. This is the, uh, this has been a couple times that the scribes and Pharisees have launched uh, legal assaults on Jesus, and here's a fresh legal assault upon Jesus and his disciples. In other words, they, they're concerned about the, the scope of Jesus' ministry growing in, in, in scope, and they want to see if they can get uh, undermine his ministry on a technicality, um, see if they can find some legal, um, a legal thing to undermine all of Jesus' ministry there in verse 1. Uh, back in chapter 3 and, and earlier on, um, they uh, remember the story of the disciples going through the fields, harvesting the grain on the Sabbath day, and the, the Pharisees came with an accusatory voice, voice saying, lawbreakers, you're, you're breaking the Sabbath. Um, this is 
kind of recapitulating a, a theme that Mark had laid down earlier. A, same, uh, a similar moment is taking place here. The Pharisees are adopting the voice of accusation uh, in regards to their legal code. Their very uh, tangled legal code. The infraction that is in question is that the disciples are eating without washing their hands, which might sound like um, some of the mothers here to their, to their 10-year-old boy. Have you washed your hands yet for dinner? With soap. Have you used soap this time? But, but it's, it's, uh, it's more than just um, the Pharisees being real, uh, real clean freaks. There's something more going on here. They're, they're very concerned that disciples are eating without washing their hands, verses 2, and then picking back up in verse 5. And Mark um, provides some insider baseball for his Greek audience. Mark was likely written uh, most specifically to a, a broad, uh, a broad um, uh, audience, but likely uh, mostly... Um, Greeks and Gentiles. And so he bears that in mind, and we see that particularly here where he gives a little bit of insider baseball. Why is this a big deal for the Pharisees? Uh, why are they being a bit of like school marms uh, correcting the disciples for not washing their hands to eat their dinner? What's going on here? So Mark, Mark fills us in, fills them and us in, his audience and us in on what, what the Pharisees had done. If you recall, the Pharisees had effectively taken the Levitical code for the priesthood, and they wanted to sort of popularize it and make it a, um, a requirement upon all Jews, upon all Israelites, that they needed to follow these cleanliness codes. Um, but they not only, it wasn't just a, a revival movement of let's return to the Bible, let's obey the Bible. Rather, they had taken that as sort of their starting point and then begun to introduce all sorts of additional layers to these requirements. So they saw the ceremonial cleansings and washings in the, in the Levitical law, and they extrapolated out from there to the point of, um, uh, way pa well past the point of possible obedience. It got to the point where you were, you were always sort of in this tangled layer of, have I, have I um, ticked this box over here without... Um, unchecking this box over here. Am I, am I okay? Am I, am, I on, am I on solid ground? And so what, what it results in is a severe um, insecurity spiritually. Have I lived up to the standard? Have I lived up to, um, to what's expected of me? Um, uh, to the point where you've, well, you've gone well past Scripture and you're now in uh, the traditions of men, which is what Jesus takes aim at here. The Pharisees taught that hands must be washed often, and not just your hands, but any um, eating vessels and even the table had to be washed, or else you'll not only defile yourself, but you'll defile others. The defilement would be, is, was contagious, in other words. And so they, they created this environment where you had to be meticulous with your, your cleansings, otherwise you were the big jerk that made everybody unclean and they couldn't go to Christmas dinner. They couldn't go to Passover dinner because you were the one that, that got them un, made them unclean. Jesus responds to the Pharisees' accusation with Isaiah's rebuke. He cites Isaiah 29, 13, and we'll pick that back up. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll look into that aspect in a little bit. But he, he cites Isaiah, and he says, Isaiah was talking about you guys when he said that you draw me, near me with your lips, you honor me with your lips, but your heart is far from me. You teach, uh, in vain do you worship me, because you're teaching the doctrines of men um, instead of the word of God. He, he, he points at them and says, as Isaiah was talking about you guys. When, he was, when, when Isaiah wrote that, when Isaiah proclaimed that, he was talking about you. And, and he explains that they are the epitome of replacing God's clear command with man-made tradition, verses 8 and 9. Jesus is not content just to cite Isaiah. He actually goes on to, to tighten the screws further on these accusers. Jesus demonstrates that they've broken Moses' command to honor father and mother by inventing a legal loophole to avoid financially supporting their parents while appearing to honor God, verses 10 through 12. So Jesus cites here the, 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 the fifth commandment. Moses said, honor your father and mother. And if you know the rest of that verse, how, the rest of the, the fifth commandment is, is what? 
you'll have long life and, and, and many days. You'll um, honor your father and mother that it may go well with you, that you may live long in the land the Lord your God is giving you. Long life is promised upon faithful honor of children to their parents. But Jesus only cites the first half of that verse, and he brings in another citation from uh, elsewhere in the Mosaic Law. And he says, remember that honor your father and mother, but cursed is the one that um, curses the one uh, who uh, so curseth father and mother, let him die the death. In other words, the violation of the fifth commandment to curse father and mother was to bring a death penalty upon yourself. And Jesus puts those two verses together to highlight what the Pharisees are doing with just one of their um, uh, traditions of men. And he points out this particular one where the, the way it would go is if you, you were sort of at odds with your parents, you were estranged, there was what we might say family drama taking place between you and your parents, um, you could, you could um, get out of the obligation to be their social security, to be their... To, be their caregiver in their old age. You could get out of it if you took your, your finances or your property and you uh, dedicated it to God. The word there is Corbin, uh, to dedicate it to, to the temple. So you dedicate it to the temple and you can dust your hands and say, oh, mom and dad, I can't support you. I can't take care of you. Very, very sorry. I've devoted that to, to God. I am a very holy person. I gave this to God. I gave my property to the Lord. It's, it's God's now. Sorry, mom and dad, you're going to have to eat um, mushy peas the rest of your <laughs> until you die. Sorry, nothing I can do about it. Now, the ironic thing, the, the, even, uh, the, the more insidious thing, was that they were under no obligation to actually give it to the temple. <laughs> Merely by saying they were going to, it was off limits from their, their parents. And Jesus is saying, what you are doing is you're taking this, this command of Moses that's very plain and clear, honor in, in biblical terminology, uh, largely assumes financial support. Um, so children, obey your parents, turns into children, it, adult children, you need to be working your tail off so that you can support your parents, honoring them and by caring for them in their old age. That honor turns from obedience into financial support. Jesus says you take this a commandment that's clear as crystal and you've uh, massaged it in such a way to get yourself off the hook of actually obeying what God said. Their traditions have not f resulted in fulfilling the law. Rather, they've undermined the very basis of their authority. They, in fact, are under the condemnation. They are, in fact, under the death penalty that comes with the violation of God's word. They've undermined, they've made void, Jesus says in verse 13. They've made void the word by, by holding fast to their traditions. And so, what Jesus does is quite unexpected in our modern, nice, evangelical, don't ruffle any feathers kind of culture. Jesus gathers the whole crowd around and tells a joke with the Pharisees being the butt of the joke, pun intended. Jesus then tells a joke to the crowd at the expense of the Pharisees. What goes in you doesn't defile. What comes out the other end is what makes you unclean. It's a little bit of off, we might say that's a bit off color, isn't it, Jesus? Isn't that a bit over the line? That's not, that's not church talk, Jesus. We don't talk that way in church. What comes out, verses 14 and 16, Jesus tells this joke. It says in, in, Mark's, uh, in Mark's words, it, call, it calls it a parable, but it's much more of a joke than anything else. The disciples pull him aside, very concerned, and ask, can you explain the joke to us? That's the worst thing to do to a joke, right? You don't want to explain the joke. It ruins the fun. The disciples ask Jesus to explain the joke parable, and he reproaches them for needing the joke explained, verses 17 through 20. He says, you don't get it, do you? You, you missed the point. Man thinks that holiness resides in himself, and he's trying to keep all the dirtiness away, all the defilement away. He's trying to keep it out, and the Pharisees are trying to keep out the filth um, uh, by, by, by all these washings, all these ceremonies, all these laws. 
uh, by all these traditions of men, they're trying to keep the, the darkness and the defilement at bay. And Jesus says, uh, man thinks holiness resides in himself, but Jesus' punchline is that our show holiness, he says, all of that is raw sewage. All your, your, your self-righteousness, that's just dirty rags. What's in man? Well, nothing good. Verses 21 through 23, Jesus lists all these vile things that are in here, that are in the depths of man's heart. Man, there's no good thing that dwells in man. It's not trying to keep the darkness at bay. Rather, the darkness flows out of us. The defilement comes from inside of us. Jesus then goes on to a pre predominantly Gentile area. Uh, so um, after the feeding of the 5,000, if you recall, he went to the, sort of the north shore of the Sea of Galilee. And I'm, I'm assuming that this event with the Pharisees that we just talked about took place in that same area. But then Jesus goes over to a predominantly Gentile area there on the Mediterranean Sea on the coast of it. So he's gone over from the North Sea of Galilee a little ways west um, to the area of Tyre and Sidon. He tries to hide and get away from it all, so to speak. His presence, uh, once more, can't be hidden. The word is getting out, and it's getting out even in a Gentile area. The Gentiles are becoming curious about this rabbi from Israel and the great works that he's doing, such that we get one zoomed-in example of the Syrophoenician woman who knows that this great rabbi from Israel can do great works. And so she comes to him. She falls at his feet, much like Jairus had done in, in the earlier episode where his daughter was healed. She runs to him, falls at his feet, and she requests deliverance for her daughter from a devil, verses 25 through 26. Now, I want you to sort of hold on to this for future sermons, but this is the second to last demon Jesus encounters in Mark's gospel. Um, up to, up to this point, there's been a number, one of the emphasis points in Mark's gospel is the driving out of unclean spirits. This is the second to last um, interaction Jesus will have with unclean spirits. The next one will be in chapter 9, and it will be the last of the exorcisms in Mark's gospel. So just hold on to that. We'll come back to that in a future sermon. This will be the second to last demon Jesus encounters in Mark's gospel. The woman pleads for him to deliver her daughter from this devil, and Jesus responds once more in an unexpected way with a joke, with a quip, with a quip that might strike our modern sensibilities a bit out of line. Isn't this a bit misogynistic and insensitive to people's uh, uh, sensitivities? Jesus responds to her request with a quip. He says, well, it's not right to take the children's bread and feed it to the little dogs. And if you're, if you're following, if you can crack the riddle he just told, the joke that he just told, it's the children of the Jews. He is the bread. He's the word. He's the seed that's going out um, and, and to be a blessing to Israel. And it's not proper to give it to the dogs. He's implying that the Gentiles are dogs, which was a common way for the Jews to refer to, to the Gentiles. And it should be noted, the Gentiles referring to the Jews. They, there was not a lot of affinity between the two groups. The, the disciples struggled with Jesus' first joke, but this woman, this Gentile woman, gets it. She gets the joke. She replies with a faith-filled retort. She comes back with her own. She says, even dogs get some scraps from the children's table. And Jesus responds to her witty faith with an assurance that the devil will be expelled, and the woman returns home to find just that, verses 29 and 30 through 30. Mark is never content to let us camp out and get comfortable, so he whisks us back off, back across the Sea of Galilee to the um, southeast side of the Sea of Galilee. And this is the same area where he had, where he had performed a few chapters ago the exorcism of a legion of devils. In, in verse uh, 31, we, we see him, uh, Mark whisks us back to that to that place. Some folks bring a deaf mute to Jesus for a healing touch. They ask that he would heal him. Jesus takes him aside, and Mark gives us a, a more detailed description than usual of what Jesus does to heal the man. Jesus, uh, Mark does zoom in and linger a little bit here. Jesus pokes his fingers into the man's ears. He spits, presumably, into his hand and then touches the man's tongue. 
Jesus looks into heaven, looks up to heaven. He sighs or breathes heavily. Um, uh, you, should, you should have connotations there of the Spirit of God breathing uh, over, over creation. And in Pentecost, it's anticipating these things. It's alluding to and anticipating these things. And then he commands the closed ears and mouth to be opened. And Mark, like he'd done with Jairus' daughter, once again, he, he preserves the Aramaic word which Jesus spoke, um, ephata. And we'll come back to that in a, in a little bit. I want to take a bit of a rabbit trail, though, at this point, and, and, and notice a couple things. Mark is, in effect, taking the, sto- the story of Jesus, and he's, re- and he's telling it to this predominantly Greek audience with the intention of it being repeated and being repeatable in, in, in the storytelling of it. That it'd be easy to remember and be easy in an oral, oral tradition society that they'd be able to pass it along quite easily and retell it faithfully um, as, they were, as, they, as the early Christians spread out and told this story of Jesus. Mark is, in effect, sort of taking the Greco-Roman epic um, story, the Iliad and Odyssey storytelling tactics, and he's, he's telling the story of Jesus in this grand and glorious, majestic way. And there's a couple monomic devices I think that uh, Mark uses to help us and help the, his original audience to remember the story of Jesus. There's, there's three pillars that form the, 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 uh, the structure of Mark. The first is at Jesus' baptism when God the Father declares, this is my uh, son, this is my beloved son, this is the son of God. Uh, when Jesus, in a couple chapters, uh, is on the Mount of Transfiguration and the son of, and, and the God the Father speaks once more from heaven, declaring that Jesus is the Son of God. And then if we go clear to the end of the book, sorry, spoiler alert, we go clear to the end of the book, um, Christ on the cross, um, it's a Roman centurion that declares, truly, this is the Son of God. Those are the, those are the sort of signposts that hold up the whole structure of Mark's gospel. Remember, Mark uh, opened his gospel as saying that Jesus was the Son of God. That's his thesis point, and he's working his way through the entire story of Jesus to prove that point. And there's a couple other monomic devices that he uses. He introduces pairs of things. He, uh, the, the story of the Syrophoenician woman running up to Jesus, casting herself down, reminds us of Jairus running up to Jesus, pleading for his daughter to be healed. We have this deaf mute man, and in a couple chapters, we'll also have another deaf mute man that are sort of call and response um, in, the, in the story to each other. Now, but why would um, Mark um, leave us the Aramaic word? There's a couple reasons for it. Why would he preserve the original Aramaic word? And I think in part it has to do with what I just said, that it's, it's a monomic device. Because he's telling it, um, it's, it's a reminder of um, Jesus' very life, Jesus' presence here on earth, his, his humanity in, in, one, in one respect. Uh, remember, with Jairus' daughter, uh, Mark preserved the actual words in Aramaic that Jesus spoke, Talitha kumi, daughter arise. And here it's be opened, ephata to preserve the, the potency of Jesus as the true man, the true Messiah of Israel. Now, this got me thinking, why, again, why would he introduce the original Aramaic? Why go out of his way to point that out? Well, it, it reminds me of, this is the best illustration I can come up with. Um, remember in the, the Lord of the Rings where Samwise um, is, comes to the rescue of Frodo. Frodo gets stabbed by the giant spider. Um, he's knocked out cold. And Sam comes to the rescue, grabs the, 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 the file of Galadriel and, and Frodo's sword, and he chases the, the demon spider away. And, the, and Tolkien goes out of his way to say that suddenly came upon Sam these elvish words, words from a that he just, he shouts out un, unknowingly, not really knowing why he's saying them. He says, ah, Elbereth Githoniel. That's that my, that's my, very impressed, right? The, my, my cinderin is on point. Um, and, and the casual reader um, won't understand quite what's going on there, but, but, but you'll notice that if you, um, if you take a deeper look, that snatch of poetry from Tolkien, the rest of Tolkien's legendarium is a whole world of glory and literary beauty and, and, and the culture and, the, and the, the, the legends that are told uh, just from a snatch of that poem. So the very reference to that ancient tongue in, in his myth brings in a whole world of glory. And I want to show in a little bit that that's 
precisely what Mark is doing by, by preserving the original Aramaic word that Jesus spoke, be opened. So Jesus speaks the word. That, that was my rabbit trail back to the, the summary of the text. Jesus speaks the word, be opened, and once more, there's our, there's our key word of Mark's gospel, straightway. Uh, immediately, the man's ears are opened and his tongue is loosed and he begins to speak. Jesus requests that they not spread the word, but to, but to no avail. I love the way it puts it, the way Mark puts it. And he charged them that they should tell no man, but the more he charged them, so much the more, a great deal, they published it. They could not keep it in. It was exploding out into the world. Instead, they lift songs of praise, and they say, he does all things well. So having worked through the, the, the text, I want to sort of work our way backwards. Why, why does this um, story of the man uh, um, with his, uh, this deaf man and a dumb man being um, healed, um, why does Mark go out of his way, and why does Jesus sort of exaggerate this healing? This isn't showing us how to, how to do a healing for a deaf person. I think there's more going on than, than sort of giving us a, 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 a manual on how to heal deaf and dumb people. Jesus has already shown that even touching the hem of his robe will bring healing. And so why the seeming exa- exaggeration involved with this healing? Why does Mark zoom in? Why did Jesus pull him aside, put, poke, his ear, poke his ears, spit, touch his tongue, uh, look up to heaven, sigh heavily, and then sp- speak uh, speak this word of opening, and Mark even gives us the, uh, the original Aramaic. Why is there this exaggeration on this story of deafness and dumbness, of being unable to hear and unable to, to speak? This healing, as I mentioned a moment ago, is the first of a pair. This is gonna. Uh, this one is the first deaf and deaf person that Jesus heals um, in Mark's gospel. But there's going to be a second one in two chapters from now. So it's setting up um, a a payoff in a few chapters. This healing is the first of a pair. Jesus will soon face off against the last demon recorded in Mark's gospel, Mark 9, 25. And that demon causes a boy to be deaf and dumb. So after Jesus comes down from the Mount of Transfiguration, he's confronted with the last demon he will confront. And it's a deaf and dumb demon. This is the setup for that payoff. Jesus, remember his, sto- his parable of the, of the sower, where he's, he's the sower, sowing the word of God's promise to Israel. He's sowing it in Israel, and he's, it's, it's landing on various soils, and only the, the receptive soil is bearing uh, a harvest. He's been sowing the word all throughout Israel, but many are still hard of hearing. Even his own disciples grapple with his words, fail to get the joke. They're on the inner circle. They should be in on the inside joke, and they're missing it. And Jesus rebukes them for, 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 uh, as such. The Pharisees themselves, they've, in a sense, stuffed the cotton of man-made tradition into their ears and seem entirely unable to hear the word they claim to be the stewards of. And so this healing of a, of a deaf man is quite symbolic in the narrative. Israel is having trouble hearing. Even Jesus' inner circle is having trouble hearing what Jesus is up to. Jesus is coming to restore not only Israel, but as we'll see in a moment, he is coming to bless the whole world. And so Jesus, to get their attention, to wake them up, to startle them from their complacency and their stupidity and their folly, Jesus resorts to telling a parable which is more like a joke. And then he accompanies that parable with a charge for Israel. Remember, he gathers the host around, and he tells this joke at the expense of the Pharisees. Remember that? What goes in you doesn't make you unclean. It's what comes out of you that is, is, what, is what's unclean. And then he accompanies that parable with a charge for Israel. And it has its, uh, that's why this deaf man is so significant at the end of this, this section of the narrative. It's a charge which is still necessary for you and for me. He who has ears to hear let him hear. Man's condition is fatal. We've brought the just uh, sentence of death upon ourselves. Christ's word is a seed which brings about life, but we need our ears open. And so how does Jesus open our ears? Well, he wields his piercing wit to shock us awake, to poke us in the eye, to prick our hearts, to expose us to the reality that, yes, What's in here is vile and wicked. 
Ironically, it's, it's the fact of his piercing wit that's going to end up getting him pierced. It's going to land him on the cross. So the story of the deaf and dumb man being healed is, is symbolic that Israel is not hearing her Messiah. Her, her ears are plugged with the traditions of man. Of man. She's missing the riddles that the Messiah King, this, the new Solomon is telling. The Proverbs are going over her head. Now, as we continue to work our way back through this chapter, we, we need to note that the, the disciples' unwashed hands provide more than just a cause for the Pharisees to squabble over. It wasn't just the particular um, uh, offense in the Pharisees' view. Mark is hinting at something here with the disciples' unwashed hand. Mark has hinted in a, in a certain direction a couple times already, but from this cycle of his gospel onward, it's going to get clearer and clearer. In fact, in the next chapter, it's going to be very, very bright. And of course, the payoff will come at Christ's crucifixion. The, 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 the theme that's being introduced here is that the Gentiles will be blessed by the coming of the promised seed of Abraham. If you didn't wash your hands, you defiled other Jews. And so this had led the Pharisees to teach that even to enter a Gentile home, that would make you unclean, and you would spread that uncleanness to anybody you touched. You would, you would be a, a defiler of Israel just by having shared a meal in a Gentile's home. Well, nowhere in Moses' law is that prescribed. Nowhere is that uh, said to be a law. They've extrapolated out in the wrong direction and made this a commandment of men. And so Jesus comes along and says, it isn't what goes into you that defiles you, but what comes out. Now, the disciples, their unwashed hands, I think in some sense, Mark is hinting again in a direction that soon the disciples, within a few years, will be breaking bread with Gentiles because both will be washed in Christ's baptism. Both will be united to Christ through baptism. And so these unwashed hands are like the faint introduction of an instrument in the midst of a symphony. But in the rest of this chapter, and especially the next, it will swell and become too big to ignore. So notice, as you work backwards through this chapter, you'll notice that there's plenty of cues of what's going on. Jesus, the, 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 the news of Jesus, the word of Jesus is spilling over the borders of Israel, and it's flooding out into Gentile realms. For example, Jesus goes to an area full of Gentiles. He playfully banters with this Syrophoenician woman, this Greek woman, a, a Gentile woman. And he agrees. In, in bantering with her, he agrees and gives us a sign of what's coming for the Gentiles, for the dogs. They will soon eat at the table like children and not just enjoy the crumbs, but be seated at the table. And he not only does that, he delivers a Gentile girl from a demon. Jesus has been driving out demons uh, driving out unclean spirits from Israel. Remember, he's like a new David, uh, romping through Israel, driving out the Philistines. But now he, he delivers a Gentile girl from a demon. Uh, now service, notice is served that the demons will not find safe haven outside of Israel. Jesus has come to take possession of the ends of the earth, filling it with his worshipers, feeding them with the bread of his body. And so additionally, the healing of this deaf and dumb man is, a, is in a predominantly Gentile area, the Decapolis. And this healing is followed by Christ being praised among the nations. The Pharisees, they had hidden the word, but Jesus is coming to fling the word far and wide, opening even Gentile ears to hear this life-giving word of his salvation. If we go to Isaiah uh, chapter 29, which Jesus cites at, in his contention with the, the Pharisees, Listen to how Isaiah describes um, the, the, um, the hypocrites of his day. We have the section that Jesus cited. They draw near me with their mouth, that their heart is far from me. But then he says this. Isaiah says, Behold, I will proceed to do a marvelous work among this people, even a marvelous work and a wonder. For the wisdom of their wise men shall perish, and the understanding of their prudent men shall be hid. Woe unto them that seek deep to hide their counsel from the Lord, and their works are in the dark. And they say, who seeth us, and who knoweth us? Surely your turning of, this is a great description of the Pharisees. Surely your turning of things upside down shall be esteemed as the potter's clay. For shall the work say of him that made it, he made me not? Or shall the thing framed say of him that framed it, he had no understanding? 
Is it not yet a very little while, and Lebanon shall be turned into a fruitful field, and the fruitful field shall be esteemed as a forest? And now, look how Isaiah proceeds. And in that day shall the deaf hear the words of the book, and the eyes of the blind shall see out of, the, out of obscurity and out of darkness. The meek also shall increase their joy in the Lord, and the poor among men shall rejoice in the Holy One of Israel. For the terrible one is brought to naught, and the scorner of is consumed and all watch for iniquity and all that watch for iniquity like the Pharisees hunting for infractions will be cut off that make a man an offender for a word and lay a snare for him that reprove that reproveth in the gate and turn aside the just for a thing of nothing and then if we skip forward a few more chapters in Isaiah, Isaiah 35 when Jesus the, the Pharisees had hidden God's word but uh, they they were cor- corrupting and twisting and, and, and mangling God's word. But Jesus has come to fling the word far and wide, opening even Gentile ears to hear this life-giving word of his salvation. And this is the main reason, I think, why the word ephata is preserved. It's an allusion back. It's, it brings in this whole host of um, prophetic meaning. In Isaiah 35, the prophecy of the way being made straight and Israel being restored It says this, strengthen ye the weak hands and confirm the feeble knees. Say to them that are of a fearful heart, be strong, fear not. Behold, your God will come with vengeance. Even God with a recompense, he will come and save you. And get this, then the eyes of the blind shall be opened. The word there is ephata. And the ears of the deaf shall be unstopped. Ephata. Then shall the lame man leap as in heart, and the tongue of the dumb shall sing. And in the wilderness shall waters break out, and streams in the desert in the Gentile regions. And the parched ground shall become a pool, and the thirsty land springs of water. In the habitation of dragons where each lay shall be grass with reeds and rushes. And in highway, remember Mark is saying, the way is being made plain for the coming of Messiah. The highway there shall be in a way, and it shall be called the way of holiness. And the unclean shall not pass over it. But it shall be for those, the wayfaring men, though fools, shall not err therein. No lion shall be there, nor any ravenous beast shall go up thereon. It shall not be found there, but the redeemed shall walk there. And the ransom of the Lord shall return and come to Zion with songs and everlasting joy upon their heads. And shall obtain joy and gladness and sorrow and sighing shall flee away. And so, when Christ opens their ears, this man who is healed is symbolic of what he is going to do for not only Israel, but for all the ends of the earth. He will open their ears, and when he opens their ears, they will also sing, as Isaiah foretold. The word of Jesus' universal reign, which we celebrate on Ascension Sunday, is proclaimed, and the fitting response is always songs of praise. And so I want to make some application to us. What Jesus is doing here in Mark 7 is going to land him on a cross. He's putting the Pharisees' sin on a billboard, and he is mocking their foolish scruples. He is shaming our holiness. You think, and this applies to us here, we oftentimes think that you might think that your holiness is found by taking your kids out of public schools, which is a good thing. But... If you make this a commandment of men, while on the other hand, exploding with anger at them, neglecting to train them in the word, or being permissive in the entertainment you allow, you are found a hypocrite. You might claim to be a defender of traditional marriage, but what's in your browsing history? Where have you failed to submit to your husband or be a loving or be loving to your wife? You might despise the government printing money on demand, like monopoly money, but is your work ethic outpaced by a moss-covered sloth. Jesus came to put our sins up on a billboard. Jesus did not come to drive out a pagan oppressor from Israel. Jesus came to show us the sewage that comes out of the human heart. Jesus came to show us we are dogs. Jesus came to show us where we've voided God's word. But he also came to truly wash us by baptism into him. He came to truly open our ears. He came so that the dogs could become children. He came to open our ears so we could hear the joke. And he came to loose our tongues so that we could laugh at our own folly. Let's pray. Our God and Father, we thank you for your word, and we thank you that by your spirit you apply it to our hearts. I pray that you would convict us and show us ways in which we've lived according to the commandments of men and not according to your word. I pray that you would give us 
the joy of your spirit as you work through us and in us that we might be truly holy as we rest in you and in your righteousness alone. We pray now back to you the words that our Lord Jesus taught us to pray, saying, we really must get it into our minds that this table is a royal banquet. You do not arrive at this table as paupers or beggars. This table is as long and high and wide and deep as the love of God, which he has shown to us through Jesus Christ our Lord. There is room for each saint to pull up a chair. We sit on the Shadowlands side, while those who have gone before feast on the other side of the table. But we all partake one holy food. And though the sign itself and this table itself are small things, what they represent to us is the boundless storehouse of God's kindness to the sons of men. You are forgiven. You are welcome through Jesus Christ. As the prophet Hosea promised, you are no longer called not my people, but God through Christ calls you my people. All of this is gloriously true because Christ ascended on high. His ascent is yours as much as his death and resurrection are. Our weekly feast together here is a commemoration of that fact. And so, by faith, see this table in the midst of heaven's banqueting hall. The Spirit raises us up into that hall, and we're regaled with the wonderful story of Christ's conquest as found in the Scriptures. Our songs, in a manner of speaking, are joyful toasts under the heroic acts of Jesus. And around this table, we are brought in on the joke that is his overthrow of evil. I mean, what is more ridiculous than evil seeking to kill God? Or that we who were once sinners are now holy ones through Christ. And so rejoice, for the Christ who died and rose again is now the Lord of heaven and earth, and this is his feasting hall, and this is his feast. And so come in faith and welcome to Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Our God and Father, we thank you for the great salvation you purchased for us with the blood and body of Christ your Son. You have sent forth your Spirit, and we are certain that all your love for your Son is extended to us, and all the power you exerted in raising him up from the grave and unto glory is the same power which raises us up from our sin and into your life of holiness. And so we give thanks now in Jesus' name, and amen. And so the charge is this, sin is trying to pull a fast one on the all-seeing and all-knowing God. It's, it's trying to, anytime we sin, we're trying to convince ourselves that God won't see our sinful actions. And so repentance then is a laughing matter. Repentance is a laughing matter. It's, the self-righteous are the ones who take themselves too seriously, but the humble are able to see the folly of their ways, laugh at themselves, and in true humility, true repentance, they learn true wisdom from Christ, the ascended King. And so here with believing hearts and open hands, the benediction of God our Father. The peace of God which passes all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. And the blessings of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon and remain with you always. And amen.